about. Hi, everyone. We're very happy today to have for our first mm -hmm. particle theory uh, seminar of the quarter, our very own Sungwoo Hong. Um, Sungwoo, tomorrow will uh, leave us for uh, wow. Korea Kais in, uh, he will be a professor in Daejeon at Kais. Uh, so we're very proud of him. Um, <laughs> And um, and as a final uh, 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 our final day with him, we want to extract all the knowledge that he can give us uh, before he leaves. So uh, ask lots of questions, and we'll um, get everything from him. And uh, Sungwoo, so whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, uh, everybody, for uh, coming to this talk. And it has been such a great time uh, being here uh, last year. And I can't believe that this is already my last. Uh, you know, meaningful you know, not really last last, but that is the uh, very good. Uh, that uh, I'm going to leave tomorrow. Uh, I still have some like space. Anyway, so that's the problem that you can figure out. So, uh, thanks everybody. It's a really great uh, theory group that I, I think one of the best group I ever experienced. Yeah, and it has been such a fun uh, interaction with both particle physics community and formal uh, theories and then conventional the theories. Because I found that fun and then I had a lot of time. So I really thank everybody. Uh, so, yeah, today, as I said, that uh, I, I'll try to give a one talk before I disappear. So, the title I, I would call uh, Coupling a Cosmic String to a TQRT. So, some of you might be familiar with the idea of coupling a local QRT to a TQRT. So, it's kind of that thing, but especially if you're one of the central players, it's going to be cosmic string or vortex uh, configuration. Uh, this is based on my uh, collaboration with the Daniel Brenner. Is here in case you forgot his page already. And then, uh, okay. so uh, feel free to jump anytime, any questions, any clarifications or corrections, please, anytime uh, during the talk. All right. So, uh, you might have to click again on the slide. Oh, there is a. So uh, symmetry, right? We, we all love symmetries, enjoy symmetry. We use symmetry every day, and probably we don't know what to do with the physics without using symmetry anymore. But that symmetry. So a lot of things I talked about today is about symmetry too. So here is the one slide summary of not even summary, some some brief list of how symmetry has been played in particle physics or field theory in general. So obviously we all know that symmetry has played a humongous role in any every area of theoretical physics. For example, standard model matter context interactions are organized according to uh, standard model gauge groups, yet without knowing what is the exact local structure of, of the standard model gauge group. And for example, in strong sector, we know that a lot of IR physics can be understood and derived by organizing them in terms of global symmetry breaking panel, right? So, uh, global symmetry is a real symmetry in the sense that they organize the representations of matter contents, they impose the selection rules on the gauge itself. Or dynamics, and they can be broken either explicitly or, or, or spontaneously. They can be anomalous, and they can be gauged if we will. For example, uh, in the, again, in the story of the strong dynamics, we learned that there's a particular type of anomalies among the old global symmetry current that taught us a lot of consistent checks in the theoretical physics, for example, right? In the current perturbation theory, uh, because of the two anomaly matching, uh, we learned that we must uh, add the theory of all the interactions for the resonant return action, and that of course taught us a lot about physics in, in the hydronic physics of the dynamics, including CP violation and also the size of the neutral time decay to the gamma gamma, uh, and then for example, strong statistics and many others. So this is just the extremely brief list of what the symmetry has done for us, right? And in recent years, like last decade or so. The notion or concept of symmetry has gone through really in a humongous generalization. And we have a world expert in this, in this audience who has contributed a lot, developed the concept, the machinery, everything. So, uh, for example, we are very used to talk about ordinary symmetries, the global symmetries that act on the local operator, particle. So, we look at the local correlation function, you extract the asymmetries out of that, you learn why are the symmetries acting on those objects. Those are the usual symmetries that we are familiar with. Now we start talking about okay, back in uh, December 10th of years already the symmetry that acts on the extended object, like in line, one dimensional object we call the one form symmetry, and two dimensional object with surface operators they call the two form symmetry, and so on and so forth. 
And there is another type of generalization, right? So usually a lot of the circle symmetries that we are familiar with, like symmetries, 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 and so on, they're all you know organized in the form in the form of mathematical structure called a group, right? Now we know examples where the mathematical structure is not just a simple groups, but it has another structure, higher groups where uh, symmetries of a different form degree are mixed with each other. Or there is, there is also a notion of uh, uh, non immutable symmetries. There are several important papers last year and the year before. It came out. And so, symmetries that come without inverse operators. Okay, so, obviously, it doesn't form a group. And for example, there are other directions of general agents. And maybe it keeps going. And we may learn eventually what you really need by the symmetries and how they play in understanding dynamics of physics. So, uh, I mean, this is just an insane short list of how. Generalized global symmetries I presented in the first slide uh, has played, has shown uh, how powerful they are in understanding of understanding of the quantum field theory. So, on particle physics, right, who are interested in also learning a lot of aspects of uh, quantum field theory. So, here, really, the relevant question for myself and uh, my like, collaborators are is there or are there generalized global symmetries in four dimensions QFD that are relevant to particle physics? And if the answer to the first question is yes, the question then the second immediate question is that whether there can be a set of observable things, even if it is a principle, okay, which is associated with or due to the presence of those generalized laws. Okay, so it's basically the question number one, two, or even three, where uh, whether generalized uh, global symmetry can provide some novel or a, a meaningful solutions to the problems the existing part of physics. So basically, the question here overall is that. What can generalized global symmetry do in particle physics? Right, that's basically the question. So uh, today I will basically focus on the first question. Although I think that the, the answer to the third question seems to be pretty positive because I'm speculating, working with a great uh, set of collaborators. Uh, but uh, today I will just focus on the first question, making very simple, uh, simple QFD example. So uh, the answer to the first question, uh, there are many examples. But in particular, today I'll just focus on uh, what's called the max, max uh, axiom macro theory, as you will see immediately. And then it's topological modification, meaning I will take that theory coupled to some set of a uh, topological quantum field theory. And then, I, and, and then I ask whether such a topological modification of a simple theory that we are very familiar with comes with an actual observable uh, consequences because of those uh, things we have been talking about. Okay. For example, I will demonstrate hopefully that I take again axiom Maxwell theory and couple to a Zn topological quantum field theory in the form of axiom portal coupling, which I will show you. And then I show that, that there's explicit modification of a local quantum field theory. But, but instead of having a modification in the 4D form theory, it's going to happen in terms of a two dimensional local string Roshi QFT. And in the second part, I will discuss if I gauge. This crystal group of some symmetry existing in such a theory, and this time, uh, this gauging will have this modification of the positive constraints. Okay, so, this is like a very short, brief summary of what I'm going to talk about. Right. So that's the uh, game plan. That's the plan of the, uh, uh, the talk. So, here is the outline of my talk. So, first, I will just go through uh, some aspect of the axial metal theory. It's an extremely simple theory. I hope you all know, maybe you play every day. But nonetheless, there are a lot of set of generalized global symmetries. I'll just go through some of them. I think it's fun to talk about it a little bit. And then I would go through two different kinds of PQFD couplings. We're coupling to a sector of a topology quantum field theory and discusses the uh, theoretical and observational aspects. Okay, so that's the. All right. So let's get started with the axiom method here. So really, I'm talking about this. Right. There's an axiom, there's a U1 gate theory vector, and then there's a transcendence action with the coupling content, which is the inferior, inferior value. Right. Very simple. And here? Oh, good. So, yeah, I'm not responsible for my uh, <laughs> as usual. I'm a physicist. So I'm not taking that responsibility. But uh, so I'm going to have to take the responsibility in my case. Okay, the other one, yeah. So, yeah, I'll just use uh, the differential form. Most of you might be familiar, right? Basically, the wedge product is a total anti-symmetrization. And then if you see wedge and star, okay, there's a mathematical aspect. Basically, it's contract. Just for, for this. 
Okay, so this theory has a large scale of general explosion. I, I studied it by, earlier by a group of Japanese uh, authors, Ursula Clay and Daniel. Study those as well too. Okay, so first of all, there's a zero form action sheet. Zero form because it acts on the local operator called the axiom Q, and it basically shifts. Right? We all know because the axiom is goes and goes and we pump it up. Now, a uh, formal way to understand that is that first you look at the equations of motion of axiom and you, you interpret this as a conservation equation for the current, then there's a current, and therefore there's a the shift, the symmetry. Now, if I include the fact of this transcendence interaction, this equation of motion gets modified, including this term. It turns out that this term breaks original U1 shift symmetry to the K of K of this constant. Okay. As usual, right? If you introduce extra interactions, they tend to break more things. That's what happens. Okay, so then what do you do? Okay, now it looks like this is not conserved, but you can redefine your current by shifting around, moving around this thing. Now there's a control current in this form. This is gauge invariant if you integrate this over a three a closed three manifold. So here is the charge that you do, and then you can define symmetry operator or symmetry defect operator. Now, what you do is usually is that here's a charged object, right? How do you measure such charge? Right? You want to know whether this guy is charged or not. Basically, you wrap the charged guy with this the surface and then measure the flow coming out of it. That's what we do. So the reason why I'm going through some details of this step is that I will just now use this kind of language to talk about other kinds of things. Good. So, uh, second symmetry I want to talk about is the two form X and Y, which is dual to the zero form X. Right? right? So, uh, zero form came from the equation of motion of axion, and there is a di identity, right? In the differential form D squared is zero. Again, you interpret this as a conservation equation, and then it uh, turns out that the, this is a two form because the zero form symmetry comes with J and U single index. And then this one comes with a three index. So there is an O by one, this is two form symmetry. But the deeper reason, more proper reason why this is two form symmetry is that first we construct the charge, but it turns out that the charged object under this symmetry is a two dimensional object. Okay. In other words, in this case, so this charge by integrating this along the one dimensional closed manifold, that is the winding number of axioms. And it measures if there is a cosmic string, so there's a string. At a fixed time, it travels to a two-dimensional object. Okay, so it measures the winding of that object. Therefore, uh, it may be good to remember that the, there's a two-form action winding symmetry in the charged object with a two-dimensional action. Okay, good. So there are also other symmetries. For example, now I can look at the equations of motion of this vector, and again I interpret that as a current equation, and then again that gives me one-form uh, electric symmetry. Turns out, if I include also the effect of this term, it breaks this U1 one form symmetry down to JK, again, K of this coupling. I can do the same exercise, again, by constructing conjunct current. And then here, turns out that this is the one form symmetry. So the conjunct, sorry, the charged object is a one dimensional object called the Lusten Okay, You can think of that as a remnant of a heavy charged charge state. There's a heavy charged state and traveling, creating one line that looks like the uh, Lusten line in the IR. That's the uh, charge object. Yes. The cosmic, what is the cosmic string in that? Thing? It's just the axon that condensed. So no. Uh, so cosmic string is, is the is the so in this in this IR language, it's just the um, a vortex configuration. Okay, but it extended along the one direction that looks like therefore one D object string, and then because it travels in time, it fits through the two-dimensional roll shape. So that is the cosmic string configuration. But, but in the vortex of the axon. Uh, no, so in, in the UV, for example, action comes out of the Golston boson of some, some UV uh, scalar. And that UV scalar can have either vacuum solution, or you can also take some solid particle solution called a, a vertex for cosmic string. So that's one of the possible acceptable classical solutions to the equation of motion of UV scalar. scalar uh, UV. I will show you the UV scalar. Okay, and then there's also a dual symmetry to one from electric symmetry. Again, there's a Bianca identity for this uh, UN EM sector. You interpret that as a uh, current conservation, and this turns out to be one from magnetic symmetry, and the conserved current, sorry, the charge object is not true to it, which is kind of IR ramification of a super heavy monopole. So there's a monopole, travels, world line, that is its good Okay, so 
So here I'll present four sets of the symmetry and for this such a simple formula theory. And turns out that the, these symmetries are mixed up together each other. Right? There are these four sets of symmetries, they mix up together. So here, just illustrate the, the point very quickly. So let me just first rewrite this kind of Simon section in some five-dimensional manifold whose boundary is our space and time. I'm just rewriting in terms of, in terms of the, the fictitious five-D manifold. But we know that the theory should not depend on the choice of n5 because I'm just choosing the, some, some uh, uh, five-dimensional manifold to rewrite. Okay? This will turn out to be important. So now I introduced to you four different kinds of global symmetry here. So whenever we have a global symmetry, right, as a field theory, what we do is the following. So if we had a global symmetry current, now you couple that to the source field called the background gauge field, and you use that to compute the correlation function of the current, right, by, by that in function of derivatives. So this action, I claim that is the action of the previous one, but I, I couple to all possible background gauges, so then a consistent way. For example, recall that um, the actual shift of symmetry current was f times wet star dA. So that is the current I couple to one of the background gauges. And I have done it all consistently. Uh, now, the point is the following. So this the curly G4 and curly H3 are uh, field strength of the two form winding symmetry and one form uh, magnetic symmetry. Now, because we learned that this takes the you know, ZK value, remember there's a U1 shift to symmetry broken by transient detection. There's a one form electric symmetry also broken down to the ZK one form because of transient detection. So it takes a lot of fractional value here. Now, demanding that the, this action is independent of choice N5, therefore, uh, requires that this cannot just simply, you know, the naive field strength of its own kind. That K, what is that K? Yeah, so good. So you might say there's no sense in the car, that's your Yeah. But nonetheless, it's possible uh, to define a charge object by independent of those back to one to get here. So nonetheless, it is possible. So starting from this equation, right? This is the equation of motion for Maxwell factor, including transaction. This doesn't look like a conjugate function. But then I can just shift the rewrite in this way. So you might not just uh, literally interpret that as power, but nonetheless, you can integrate this object to define the charge operator and then construct the symmetry gauge that, that construction. Okay, so moving forward. So this is the action that I, again, coupled the original theory to all sets of the background gauge field and demanding that this is independent of the choice of N5 requires us to modify what I mean by field strength of, uh, you know, uh, two form winding symmetry and then one form magnetic symmetry. And the consistent choice turns out to be this. Okay, if you trust me, if I do that, then this is independent of the choice of N5. Now I can interpret what this means. Okay, what does this mean? So let me just look at this. So this is the background field or source field for one form electric symmetry. So if I turn on or activate the background field for the one form electric symmetry in the space and time, they manage to turn on the field strength of the two form winding symmetry. What about this? So if I turn on the background gauge field or source field for the zero form shift symmetry and another set of one form electric symmetry background field, then it managed to turn off the field strength of the of the one form magnetic symmetry. So there are this kind of mixing effect among the like symmetries of a different form degree, and they turns out uh, that they, they, they are known to be higher groups. In this case, the correct name turns out to be three groups to maximally confuse why there's all already this mismatch by one because the symmetry is that there's a zero, one, and two. So so you gotta confuse people. So you choose the three group. Maybe there's a better mathematical reason why there's that effect. I'm gonna go sorry. I also inherited that. Yeah. Right. So, so good. Now you 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 know why we are confused. So that that is by one. You have got to switch right away. So this is three groups. The same as the mismatch. Yes. Three brain is that same. Yeah. Okay. So I just went through you know this simple theory and set of the symmetries and it has some generalized global symmetries. Very recently, last year, this year, this summer. Wait, while I was in Korea, he excited me because he put up a paper and said this, this year also has what's called a non-invertible. 
the symmetry that looks like you know fractional you, know, you want shift fractionals or you know, axial rotation of on the axial, but nonetheless the consistent definition comes with it with another factor in such a way that it, it does come with its inverse operation. Anyway, so I'm happy to talk about some details if you're interested. I have a some backup slide. For now, anyway, this symmetry has a lot of geometry. Okay, so that's just a problem I could have done that. But let's I do that. So let's now uh, go on to TPI. So, uh, the first key capital coupling I want to talk about is this one. So, suppose I have a sector of a local quantum field. Okay, so that, that theory I call this. So, for the lack of a better name, I call this a sector A. So, I'm just giving myself this one. So, so now this is my sector A, my, my work. Okay, and this type of configuration we particle physics do every day, right? So, we want to talk about, I want to create my own dark, dark matter tool. How do I do? Here's the standard model, here's the dark world, it connects by some interaction, local interaction, portal interaction, hidden valley, all kind of stuff you do every day. So here exactly I'm doing it, but the only difference compared to the conventional game is that I'm just gonna take couple to some sort of topological quantum field theory instead of some usual local quantum field theory that we, that has some local degree freedom. Okay, so here I'm taking a ZNPQRP that has a two topological degree freedom. One form D1 and two form D2, which I've explained in that slide, what I mean by that. So for now, let me just focus on what do I mean by this, this interaction. Okay, how do I copy that? That's easy because I just take this, okay, and then take some generalization. Okay, so FA is a field strength of sector A. Okay, FB is a field strength of B1. So basically, I mimic this term. So there's axion and FA from this vector, FB is that vector. Axion from that sector and FP batch FP from that sector. So done. This is the topological interaction between the two sectors. Okay. And then there's gonna be some Lagrangian or, or the dynamics that describing this sector that looks like this, which I will describe in the next. Okay, so I managed the couple. Right? Now the question is, what does this do? That's the question. All right, so um, this thing I wrote in the previous slide, I claim. That it is it is a one possible description of what's called the Zen uh, gauge theory or distribution. Good. So uh, I'll, I'll go through the derivation now. Probably if that's actually correct. So so your question is why you don't see F U uh, where it start F T. So, so so let me just then uh, do the next step. Then uh, my my that is so um, good. So best the way to understand why this describes a dead end gate theory or BF theory, because usually people write as a D wet D A, which is F BF. I mean, literally, it's where it comes from. Another reason is it's called the background gate theory. That's another reason. So uh, let me just first derive this quickly. So let me start with in the UV, there is a Ivelinix model. Okay, this is the Higgs theory. There's a U1 case group whose uh, field strength is B1. And then I take the down with the scalar recharge M. This verify is the angular degree scalar, not the radial one, not the full scalar. So that's that. Here is the kinetic term that uh, that. Now um, let me look at the cross term here. So first of all, that describes what the kinetic term of Ubi Boson goes. Let me look at it. And that describes the mass term for the deck guy, which I will decouple because I'm, I'm going to the deep. So, if, sorry, you confused our notation. FB is FB1? FB is the DB1. So, that's the field strength of the DB1. Oh, the B1. Yeah. So, it would be nice to call it one. Ah, yes. No, no, shut not because then, okay, continue. Yeah, you're right. Because uh, even though I'm not a factor of time, you're Yeah, so there's one. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's, let's move on. So, let's look at the cross term. So, that is the cross term I just wrote down. Literally, I wrote down there. Right now, if I look at this and just dualize it, remember star takes you know p form to d minus p, where d is the phase dimension. So this is d by the one form, starting with the three forms and writing as a d times the two forms. Right. So then, if I choose the proper normalization, that already looks like this. Now the question to Jeff: Why am I driving this? Because now, if you look at the equation of motion of this theory, it sets the field strength to be all zero. So it's going away. 
Understand this, I can immediately describe the dead end gauge theory because I derived it for you, right? I started with the U1 gauge theory, a case with a charge and scalar. There's, there's going to be dead end remnants. That is exactly the lap over in the IR. That's the dead end gauge theory. And Lagrange is like this. Well, again, this is the one way to describe the uh, theory. Okay, so um, as, as we just talked about, wait, this. Wait, wait. Yeah. There's no mass here. Oh, so this lamp. Now that's where is the mass scale that I'm taking star. There's a mass of photons which we can capture by star and Well, that that are right? So they pick up the mass. It's quadratic mass. That is negation by the mass. We still have a question, so I probably need to. There's just literally a map there. Yeah, there's like an yeah. n squared, yeah. 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 a p1 squared, and then yeah, scale lambda yeah. three yeah. yeah. The argument is just that we, we have this n square p1 square, which is a mass term, which is sort of way below that. So that's the only term that. Yeah, yeah. there's a mass term, and then the, 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 the fluctuating degree of freedom all uh, are free couples. But then there is a random, which is that n amount, which I'm keeping here. They are not, there's no local fluctuations of those guys. They, they are only topological degrees. And I'm just investigating the meaning. So good. So then, based on this good conversation, this theory describes the you know uh, structure of the vacuum, and therefore uh, associated the Salish rules imposed by. So this is basically constraint theory. This is one derivative theory. And in fact, as I told you, the equation for motion sets the you know just like a initial field to be zero, unless we insert some non-trivial defect operator. Okay? But nonetheless, this theory is non-trivial. And topological. First of all, this is topological because I don't have any mapping about there. Second of all, there's no local degree of propagating degree of freedom as, as shown by the equation of motion. But nonetheless, it's non trivial theory. First of all, because I can write down gauge invariant healthy looking operators. So I can integrate B1 to define a Wilson line operator. I can do the same thing with the B2 to define a Wilson surface operator. And just for the later purpose, this turns out to be the costing string. Configuration of this DS theory, which I will come back later. And this theory is not trivial because they satisfy non trivial correlation functions. In particular, all the correlation functions are classified by the dead end phase, therefore, it is a dead end. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, I mean, yeah. this is for the U1 gauge. Yeah, I started I built this model and then a big in the chapter. I think there's a non abelian version of that work works out in the original paper um, for gravity and so on. But for now, this is the key. So come, come back to this theory. So in the IR, you know, you're not asking what happened in the UV. I took my theory, A sector, I coupled the B sector, and the B sector is described as any. That's how that's right. <laughs> now the question is, this is the setup. Now the question is, uh, is there, are there IR universal observables? By IR universal, I mean that uh, I don't have to ask to know anything about the original collision of this theory. Is there a set of observable I can already say just based on the case? 
The second question is that is this a super exotic or academic setup? Or I can get this type of blood set up starting from pretty mundane uh, standard two FP. Okay, so the answer to the both questions are, are yes, otherwise, why am I standing here? Especially the second point, for example, illustrate the point that therefore it is important if we can get this type of setup starting from the pretty mundane two FP in UV, but just that it leaves out some discrete random. Just because scalar pairs is required, not your part, I'm sorry. Non minimal part, then there it is important to learn how to keep track of those information, those, those uh, effects in the infrared field. Okay, so, so and then in doing so, looks like general and global symmetry provided very strong and efficient language, if not the formula. Okay, so with that, that's the setup. So now, let actually let me discuss the uh, turbo. Okay, so let me just start with IF turbo with that. And that can be understood from normally. As you mentioned by one of the audience, as you all know. So let me just remind you, maybe you're not using anomalies of every day. Uh, so let me just quickly remind you what, what the original idea was so back in uh, 85. That, well, so here's the original theory, right? And second theory. Here's my four theories version of uh, what? Well, action screen network. Okay, so here's my space and time. Here's a beautiful green action screen. If you can do better than this, no, but this is my question. Now let me zoom in one of the things. Okay, and don't call, call this the wormhole. This is my beautiful screen right there. And then, for, for example, let me just look at the widening on this one. So what is the anomaly input? This action is a nice looking uh, gauging variant in vacuum, but this is not in the presence of a cosmos or domain. Okay. So first of all, you can check that this theory under you want a gauge transformation, not a global transformation. You want a gauge transformation. It is not invariant. So let me just discuss what, what this equation means. So first of all, the gauge variation is localized on the cosmic string worship. So this is a delta function non-vanishing only on the cosmic string. And M2 ST is the cosmic string. And then the form and size of the, the variance, the age violation is that of a 2D chiral norm. Okay. So, in a sense, cosmic stream prepares for your kind of boundary station time. And when there is a local classical topological point of field, your normal, they influence towards the boundary, creating a uh, gauge violation like that. That's what's happening here. All right. So, this is gauge anomaly, not the two, not the ABJ. This is the gauge anomaly. You gotta cancel it out. And the way we can do that is that now we can have a anomalous two dimensional QF living on the warship, and it has opposite sign of the anomaly and cancel out the, this, this uh, violation. Okay, that's due to classic variable norm. Okay, so this takes uh, accept uh, some another nice, useful, more intuitive picture in terms of curves. So let me reinterpret this time simultaneous interaction as like your gauge field coupled with its own uh, curve. This is you want a gauge uh, a gauge curve. Okay. So you can just take the function of derivative, you get this expression. Now okay, you can take look, look at the conjugation of it. Obviously, you should get the same answer. So this is not converted. Now, uh, just to illustrate the physics point, let me look at the spatial component of this curve. Okay, that looks like it is proportional to gradient of x beyond, which is nothing but winding, and then background some external electric field. Okay. Now let's imagine that I have my string that happens to travel through the background electric field. Here is the picture. So here is the electric field, my string with the winding passing through that. So if you still remember this finger thing with the vector product, you should be able to figure out that there is a curve pulling towards the core. All right. Hope I didn't mess up. Here. I first draw that way and then I okay, okay, so it up. So anyway, the point is that. Because of this the time simultaneous interaction in the presence of cosmic string, if this thing passes through the background electric field, somebody check it. So the current should flow towards the core. Now, if there to be a motion of continuity of the current, which is the same as gauge invariance, there should be current flowing through the uh, cosmic string too. Right? And who who the, who creates that? That's precisely the charge carriers localized on the cosmic string. Put it from here. Which is same as two D boson, who has uh, anomaly under U on A, gauge anomaly, canceling exactly the problem. Okay, so 
in VIR, without asking where they come from, we can make a prediction that there should be a set of the 2D Californias with this much of effective or not. Good. Now I'm ready to repeat the same exercise with this. Right now, it's trivial. So let me now let look, let's, let's look at the gauge variance with respect to A1, A sector. So there's a one term with A gauge boson, another, another term with AB. So I'm going to get the one term from here, another from here. So there's a KA, that thing, KAB. If I do the same thing with now ZN variation, remember this thing is a ZN uh, vector. So if I do the same thing, I have one term here, which is KAB, another term. So let's learn the physics out of this. What does this equation actually tell us? So I'm, I'm varying with respect to U and N gauge transformation. And then there's a anomaly proportional to FA. That is the U1A square norm. Gauge anomaly, which means that, that there should be a, a massless uh, state living on the worksheet, which is the charge under this U1A. That's what we learned, right? The second term is a mixed anomaly, right? There's a very respect to U1A, there's a ZF, so that there should be, therefore, a mixed anomaly, which means that if I turn on this topological interaction, uh, all of a sudden, this charge to matter, Fermi and Bodon, must carry extra quantum numbers. Okay, that's what this means, which is straightforward, but nonetheless, that's what it means. So let me reinterpret this in terms of curl. So I'm taking my string, passing through the U1A electric background. Because of the first time, for example, I learned that there should be a current carrying the U1A quantum number. Because of second term now, I also know that that same thing must also carry Z and carry uh, Z and uh, Okay, so in this way, I mean, it's straightforward, but nonetheless, the 2 QMT that explicitly as explicitly as possible modify if I immediately turn on this the interaction with the theory. I can do the same exercise variation with respect to B. Again, I have two terms and then one is again mixed term, the other is the ZN squared anomaly. Now I can do the same exercise. I can take a string and then suppose it passes through the background of ZN1. Okay. Then the first one tells me that well I have to have a current carrying you know, U1A, but second term also carry a that thing also should carry ZN charge. Okay. So the 2D QLT is now explicitly clear that uh, uh, does modify and therefore they also carry extra quantum numbers. But then to summarize, without a TQLT, I had a one state of consistency in the IR, and, and I have one way to turn on the that current, turns out to be a superconducting current, carrying one kind of quantum number. But if I turn on the, uh, the coupling to the TQLT sector, now I triple the number of consistent conditions. And so because of that, not only I modify the nature of the superconducting current, but also now I have more than one way to activate those superconducting currents through the coupling. Okay. Now, uh, I, I won't have a time, by the way, this seems to have a some interesting application in product that we are, we are thinking about, it, but I'm happy to say, but uh, for now, let me move on.
thing, but it's purely moving in one direction down. So there's some kind of chirality. Chirality mismatch between the yeah. down moving and up moving right. charge between the two. Yeah. So what's going on on the right? So you say the, the charge matter now carries some additional EN quantum number? That's right. How is that consistent Good. with the number of species? It's like you replicated, you changed the chiral anomaly into the left hand theory. Yes. By having by saying that you don't have just one species of fermion moving down, you yeah. have n species of fermion. So good. So, How is that consistent? Very good. So from a purely IR perspective, all I can write down is the normal matching for calculating the equation. But then I will demonstrate basically the next thing I want to talk about is that starting from the you know very simple unit theory, I will compute, I will derive a thermal set of the Fermi thermal, and I will determine the quantum numbers of that. In fact, in that theory, I will have a two uh, thermals. One is left-handed, the other is right-handed, and then uh, you can see that like by I, that the normal cancel. <laughs> Well, I thought the Fermions had a charge. Oh, you said there's. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's like many complex Fermions. Yeah, so it's not super constrained. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the answer to Fermion you need if uh, this one is the winding of 10 atomic. Then, uh, it, but it automatically comes with 10 seconds. But, but then, just for the dead end part, yeah, you, you just need a uh, one or two. Uh, 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 and flow for me to go back now. Okay, thanks for the great questions. Okay, so I didn't have time to talk about it, but let me just flash out one thing before I move on to the theory. So, um, cosmic string spectrum. In the theory without a picture of the coupling, basically, I have only action strings, which are classified as a global string because, because it comes from the, the flashes of the global string string. And also has uh, what's called the topological charge, which is action like this. Now, if I couple to the TCF detector, obviously I have original action strings, which are again a global string. There are VM strings. We talked about the surface operator, uh, and then those are either local uh, strings or uh, classified as the uh, AD. I have always shown around a little bone. Okay, little point of that. But then we suspect whether there can be hybrid strings, whether uh, you know there's a coaxial hybrid strings with, for example, VF uh, wire very thin or with breath uh, with the uh, Okay, so we are in the process kind of trying to uh, with my collaborator construct this solution explicitly. Uh, but it's curious whether such a thing is possible. If so, it's cool because now it has a local core, which turns out to give rise to a lot of gravitational waves. But there is a dress of global strings. This may generate, for example, decay to the axiom, generate what's called the uh, uh, binary bridges effect, allow. So it comes with uh, both sides of the thermal Okay, just kind of curious whether this is actually theoretically All right, so that's just a very great thing. Let me quickly go through the UV completion. Good. So um, hopefully, I mean, I, I have demonstrated at some level that. You know, this TCAP decoupling of the first kind I just showed you will lead to the direct modification of 2D string Russian gravity. And also, uh, it generates a different nature of a superconducting charge because it carries two different kinds of charges. But also, I told you that there's a one, more than one way of the triggering and turning on the charge, uh, either by the A sector E field or the B sector Z and plus. And now the question is whether uh, this can come from the standard UV CRP. The answer is yes. And again, if that's the case, then we really need to carefully keep track of random TCF effect in the whole observable space, you know, because we can simply by accident and generate a lot of those yeah, without recognizing. So, what is even completion? So, here is the first standard KSV. Okay, there's a UN gauge here, gauge, gauge, uh, gauge field, and then there's two fermions which are vector like under UN, therefore, there's no uh, data anomaly, and there's a scalar. That kicks this U1 patch pin completely, but I have to say that it's one of the charts so that I'm a lot right on the Okay, so that's good. Now uh, I can integrate the fermion first by rotating away the angular degree of freedom out of this decoupling, which I can do by means of field redefinition of some fermions. Yeah. 
that I'm showing it. But this is an almost field of definition. So the effective field theory should be supplemented with the additional uh, you know, anomalous term. That's exactly the term I'm using that term. Now, this term turns into really literally master without, without any axiom. So I can just integrate that out. If I do so, I, I will land it on this. That's the center of this. Okay? So let me just redo the same thing with this. So here is the thing. Okay. Now, in addition to the standard case BZ, and I have one extra U1 B case. Okay. Now I assign a charge n to the by one. So you, you anticipate that there's going to be dead end random in there. However, the Yukawa says that now the charge assignment will be something different in the sense that now, for example, let, let's call the charge of the assignment to be some random Q, but then chi should compensate such that this is a lot. That's why they did Again, this set of a pair, a pair of fermions still are vector like under U1A, but you immediately notice that they are not vector like under U1B. Right. In fact, uh, it, it comes with a non trivial set of gauge and all. So I can just cancel that by introducing second set of fermions. Again, it is a vector like under U1A, but now if you look at it, now they are vector like under U1B. But I want to also get rid of this second pair because I don't want to see them in the IR. And I want to be able to write down the color term, but then there you call term charge now is fixed because of everything. Again, this is charge n. So overall, you won't be able to be fixed down to the ZN. I expect that there will be ZN that goes. Okay? So this is very simple to me. Uh, you will complete that. It's a modest extension of uh, original theory. Now, you can again integrate out the fermions by again rotating away the angular angular degree of freedom. So those are a normal field redefinitions. So it should be supplemented with a normal like this. You see the F, 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 A, F, F, A, mixed term. So immediately, this uh, particular linear combination is, is to be identified uh, as an axiom field. And now you're done. You can now integrate it up, get to this one. Okay. So uh, to me, it's really modest extension. So, so this really does illustrate as a first of principle that we can have a lot of particles models that has uh, the TPRP remnant. It's just that we might not have any TPRP remnant there, but we can be there. Very simple. Now, back to uh, Jeff's uh, question. We can just compute the Fermi and zero mode size of this new theory system. And we have done that. And in fact, we, I had a two sets of fermions with a two different kinds of scalars, right? So this first set coupled to anti phi one string, and second set coupled to, for example, phi two string. And then I can solve the Dirac equation. We have determined that this set gives rise to one single left handed about fermion. And then we can determine the charge. And the second set give rise to one set of right handed fermions with this charge. We can compute the anomaly, they successfully mass, mod n, because it is a dead end, uh, dead end uh, anomaly. It, it cancels, it matches or cancels the anomaly by mod. Okay. All right, so that's the point. So, with that, with the remaining time, that's the time So, let's move on to the last one. This will be the key. If there's any questions. I'm Cairo. So this is a sorry, did I say Cairo? Bias one. This is a lamp. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. One thing that I didn't didn't well, very no no actually it is chiral in the sense that if you look at um, so this is the axis string director. Okay. So you actually pair them up by one dagger by two. So in fact they go together. If you look at the by one string or by two string. Separately, look, one is a lap of the other is part. You might think it looks like that one here. So this action reaction direction, therefore, action string direction is in such a way that one comes with the positive side, the other comes with the negative side. So it's actually pairing of this. So by one deck or by two is an action. So, it is, so, so now, so here, now I can combine this properly to figure out the zero mode on an action. But I can in principle look at any by one string combination with the by two string principle 
Um, and action string is a particular direction of phi one dagger phi. And then they actually split and then they just come together. Yeah. So that's the question. Okay, just to make sure I the U one B that we introduced that was just to cancel the extra anomaly in the system. That that was introduced so that uh, in the in the IR that is broken up to that end. So I guess that then just yeah, take off into the original. You can talk about more about like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so next 10 minutes or so. Let me go through the second picture. So here, uh, I want to gauge a discrete subgroup of the existing cancer. So, so let, let me just remind you that the big theory I, I've been studying so far has a zero connection shift, right? There's an actual local operator and shift, a material amount, actual value. Now, I told you that it is a broken down to ZK because of this current time. So that's the anomaly free part. So, this is the ZK is the ABJ anomaly free symmetry. So, I can gauge if I want to. Okay. So, what happens if I gauge? That's the question. So, the claim is that the gauging a symmetry or gauging a discrete symmetry in particular is the same as coupling the original theory to a sector of a, a TQL. So let me quickly demonstrate. It's not new. So suppose let me first talk about simple example. Here is a theory with some, for example, U on current, lower symmetry, right? And then we write that source. Now, if I decide to gauge this symmetry, what happens? Then first of all, this A U now has a lot, right? So there is a gauge theory in this vector. And then the original coupling A U J and U, or in this term, now turns into a coupling between the two. If I repeat the same exercise with my theory, here's an action shift symmetry, background gauge field. Again, there's a theory with the, with the symmetry, there's a background gauge field, curly K. Now, if I decide to gauge it, now I'm giving a life rate, right? So, in, in particular, the life, the form of the life is ZN, if you have to get that expression, because the gauge group is ZN. And this coupling that turns into the coupling between the two things. So, the gauge in the discrete group, therefore, is a non to couple original theory to a ZN TQL. Good. So then what's the physics of this? So I'm doing the gauging of this theory. Right? This is the gauging of a zero form because I gauge a zero form shift symmetry and non linearly realized decrease of spontaneous growth. Because if you, if you recall, this is the linearized U1, for example. This is the Higgs U1. Right? And then if you look at this, obviously, the action shift is already non linearly realized. I mean, I'm gauging. Not linear realized zero. All right. Now, in just the case of the discrete amount, so there's, there should be still a good notion of a local fluctuation for the action, right? So, here is the again, poor theory is present of our case of work of an action fluctuation at one value, right? Now, the fact that I'm gauging discrete zero amount means that I'm like pinching out the discrete amount, and there should be good notion of a local action fluctuation. This is to be contrasted, for example, if I decide to gauge entire year one, then we know that entire fluctuation now turns into gauge degree, right? It becomes a longitudinal. But here, I'm just getting over this month, there's still a good notion of a local fluctuation. All right, so then the question is that what happened to the action? If I do that, that's the question. And um, some of this can be understood by analyzing. What happened to the two anomaly, or in particular, by looking at some three group problem, once that happened. But here I just tell you a very straightforward, easier, a more intuitive way of looking at it. So recall that the action string is a two dimensional defect carries under two form action one. Let me just re remind you that the current was a DA, and then the charge is nothing but computing the action winding, and that this is a symmetric defect. Now, what it means that there is an object and a charge under that. Basically, I'm looking at the correlation point. This is the, the this symmetry defect operator. And then this B operator is represents the action string. There's a two-dimensional action string worksheet. There's associated the winding and thus constructing the you know, surface operator that represents the action, action. 
And the fact that this guy is tied under this symmetry means that if I look at this correlation function, it picks up the non trivial phase, in particular, the phase, you know, encodes the winding number, the charge of, of that object. Right? That's what I mean. Now, um, good. So, so I'm going to just skip this part. But let me just directly go to what happens if I gauge this result through. So I'm going to gauge the ZM, this result to subgroup of the K. Right? Now, this is the defect operator. Once I gauge the ZM, is not all gauging there. Now, obviously, we know that we shouldn't even ask the question of the you know, correlation function of gauging non invariant operators. Right? So, who are the gauge invariant operators? This becomes gauge invariant if the transformation parameter is an integral multiple to the two pi m, m of the data. So, I'm allowed to ask questions about the global symmetries and charges for those operators with alpha is equal to two pi m. Those are legal ones. So let's do that. So I'm doing the Kedakin experiment. I, I'm not durable sitting infinitely, out, infinitely far away from the positive. Sitting there. I'm trying to measure the winding of that. I'm inserting arbitrary winding number x and string. If I do the measurement, I learn that every single measurement will, will become defective phase, which is always integral multiple to that. Which means that all the measurements are observable. I just discovered that this theory has action train consists of a winding number or always integral multiple factor of n. So, so uh, the situation is this. So here is the action winding direction. Here is the string tension, which is roughly the square of the hissing direction, hissing size. And then I start with a theory where I had all integer values. Action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because of the low limit yeah. yeah, sorry. I'm here, I'll slide up to Two I law. Sorry. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you finish exactly. So I read it. Yeah. Right. So so global strings comes with the tension of the limit in So I'm not factoring that in. Thanks. Yeah. So I started with that uh, with the uh, with the whole possible integer value in my as I demonstrated in the previous slides. If I gauge it, I get it. All the measure. Good. So we have a halfway there. We have halfway there. We think that it should be kind of possible. So we have some UV theory, but we have to supplement with some uh, well-known UV type of term. Meaning, we haven't introduced the full set of fermions that completely can talk over the That's why we, yeah. 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 It is certainly trickier than purple exam, for sure. Because obviously, because the first we have read that. <laughs> oh no, I don't know. Actually. Yeah, I don't know. In principle, instead of the game I'm playing, right? I can do that. I take the entire three I can look at the part that doesn't have the two phenomena on the shelf. I can gauge that. You can ask the you can you can I don't know if that's always possible. So here we are doing like simply possible version of that kind of thing. And um, we can yeah, we have halfway through that, but we don't have to completely do that. All right, so after gauging, looks like I'm losing these guys. Where, where, where are they go? What happened? Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm chasing them. I, I will bring them back. Put them back here. Okay, so, so what happened to the other screen? Well, let's, let's see. So recall that um, I gauge non-linear realized rules. And that means that uh, in order to gauge something, that thing should be there at the world. Otherwise, I can't gauge. Okay. So there might be some scale. We are still understanding whether this is always you know, higher than this or below. Again, up to low, low neuron. In the IV sense, there is a good potential. Yeah. So, so module of that. I know that there's another scale that prepares the global symmetry that I can, I'm allowed to gauge. Now, uh, we know that once I gauge something, I turn the global something into global. What I mean by it? Take the U1 global symmetry, I think. I, have, I get now this uh, nice uh, friendly open world, which is just a little weird for that. Now, I decide to gauge U1, I'm losing it because I turn it into the gauge. Right? Here, too. 
So I started I started with the entire global screen plot, full uh, uh, picture value. If I gauge it, I lose a map into the local version of that, which is local problem. In fact, we know that um, if I gauge it, all of a sudden there is a ZM BF theory, gauge theory. That thing comes with a ZM classified Wilson Fossil problem. Those are the those are the uh, you know the guy that went to, uh, lost from here, but who says conservation of degree to three? Yeah. Okay, so in principle, okay, here I'm taking um, really I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something in principle. If one can do spectroscopy, right? for example, these findings can be measured by fiber printing. These maybe one can do AD phase. In principle, we, once one can do that, we can we can uh, tell that we're talking about theory like this or theories like this, even though it is a very subtle data case. So with that, uh, let me just conclude. So I think non-trivial key capital couplings, or more generally, uh, topological modification of given local QRP can really lead to interesting observable ones, not just the theoretical aspect. And generalized global symmetry. And their analysis plays very important role in understanding those effects. And I think this is just the beginning in the sense that uh, I'm a part of the physics group again. Really interesting question to me is that uh, what, what, what can generalized global symmetry do in particle physics? And there's some you know speculation at the moment to, to do some dark matter physics with the construction that we talked about. It looks like the kind of construction we show, I showed today, comes with a really well positive uh, symmetry. As I talked about, for example, coaxial hybrid chain, there's such a thing exists or not. And also, one can ask immediately so, why if I do the same thing with actually Yang Miller to city couple of PPFP? And we have done some work, but still going, it looks like it's a richer. There are more ways of doing this. For example, Yang Miller case, at least there are four different ways of talking with PPFP randomly. Okay. And, and what one can do with the non linear symmetry is many. Okay. So, with that, uh, let me just thank you. And thank you again for having me for two years. Great. Thanks very much, Samu. Uh, any further questions? Samu will still be around for a few hours uh, after this. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Okay. Well, one and a half yeah, exactly. So local strings uh, ha, ha, doesn't have a local weighting factor. Right. right. So uh, if I what I, what I uh, discussed today is actually full correct picture, and if I manage to have a unique complete, I'm going to have full confidence that I, that you're actually probably going to find the answer rather than the weighting factor. But that's interesting. Yeah, there's that, the gravity base, the acting abundance, the fiber fringes, there's a many uh, sets of observable peak levels for and still going. Uh, so I'm a more constrained Yeah, so I'm not like on top of the uh, current bound on the, the progress this, this uh, theory, but that's exactly what we are thinking to for the uh, next step. What might actually be the experiment to test this type of setup and where we are. Okay. Now, local cosmic strings are less constrained. Depending on how that string works out. Yeah, basically, gravity waves and uh, lagging effects, those are the kind of things that uh, does come with a vibrant sentence. What guidance would you give to experimentalists who are looking for axions at this point? So, you mean in this theory, uh, how would experimentalists uh, so, so look for axions in this theory? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, good. So, uh, there are sets of uh, experiments which are already there because this is anyway the kind of the action theory couple to our, for example, the work in that kind of uh, setup. So, all kind of experimental setups that have been doing so far can be applied there. Here, I'm just pointing that there are extra stuff one can possibly do if I couple this theory to the spectrum of PCRT. 
And those are doubly fat. The question is, you know, uh, we, so this is the first step for that. We just laid out the theoretical features, which is that have a closer context with operable. Now, the next step immediately is to make a real connection to the operable. So that, that's what I'm planning. Did you bring some cake or something? Yeah. Do you need to walk back? I don't have We have cake on Monday. I'm gluten free. I can't have the cake. The dessert says, I will bring it. Right, let's thank someone. 